think we'll go ahead and get started then. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad to see we've got a few people here um, to hear about our West Nile virus um, uh, education program here tonight. My name is Kelvin Tainatongo. I'm with the uh, City of Lancaster. Um, I just want to also let folks know that um, this is being telecast as well, and we'll have um, this uh, presentation also available on the uh, local Channel 28 uh, government channel. And then we're also going to have this also streamed on the uh, city website. So if you know folks who weren't able to uh, come to tonight's presentation, let them know that they can still see um, the, uh, the presentation either on the city's website or on the uh, local Channel 28 as well. So they'll have the opportunity to do that as well. Um, tonight, uh, we're here to talk about West Nile virus. As many of you have heard that uh, we have um, incidents that have occurred up here in the Antelope Valley uh, with West Nile virus in a number of um, uh, birds, but also um, at least one, if not more than that, incidents with, the, uh, with humans um, being infected by West Nile virus. So tonight, um, we're going to hear about what is West Nile virus, um, how it's contracted, um, how to, to reduce the chances of um, being um, infected um, with the West Nile virus, and then also how to protect yourself um, from um, um, getting that um, particular disease. Um, with us tonight, we're going to be hearing from Judy Anderson, who is the DEET um, Education Program um, Manager, and also uh, Karen, Karen Miller of the Antelope, Antelope Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District is here tonight. And then we have two folks here from public health. We have Roger Cruz. Um, who's, uh, I believe, a, a public health nurse. And then we have Barbara Holtwick, who's a health educator, that also um, give us some information tonight as well. So let me go ahead and get started and, and ask Judy Anderson to come up and speak. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I've come to California from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, via Washington, D.C., and my presence here means that there's something bad going on, not something good, although I'm really happy to see all of you and to, to meet you. Um, and the reason I'm here is that you have the number one position in something, and that is you are number one in the state of California for the incidence of West Nile virus in humans. And that's going on right now, and that's something you need to be concerned about. Um, Barbara's going to go into fairly great detail about the disease, its symptoms, and all of that. But I just want to set the, the playing field a little bit for you by telling you that West Nile virus has no cure. There is no vaccine. So the only way to not get it is to prevent interaction between you and mosquitoes that may be infected with West Nile virus. Karen's an entomologist. She's going to tell you more about the mosquitoes and what her group is doing. And as I said, Barbara's going to give you more detail on West Nile itself. I've been working in the West Nile virus communications arena since this disease landed in New York in 1999. And I've spent a great deal of time in California every year. And every year, we end up going to the spot that's the hot spot. A couple of years ago, it was Lodi in the Stockton area. Uh, we've been to Bakersfield. We've been to San Diego. We've been everywhere. I've seen parts of California I didn't even know existed. But wow, what a great state. But the mosquitoes really do bring with them a serious risk, and you need to be mindful. And your assignment tonight, when you go home, is to tell three people what you learned and ask them to tell three people what you've told them because it's only by word of mouth that you're going to get this communicated effectively and hopefully people will watch what they're videotaping here tonight so that they can hear the full story and hear it from experts like Barbara who has um, really got a, a very good presentation for you. I've brought with me a three-minute videotape of six West Nile virus survivors. I've interviewed probably 40 of them around the country, um, many from California. West Nile leaves people with really serious problems if you get the serious form of the disease. Um, and even the mild form of the disease is not much fun. I have a very good friend named Lyle Peterson, who is an MD. He heads up the CDC's Vector-Borne Disease Division. So 
In all of the US, he is the numero uno guy for West Nile virus. And who gets West Nile virus? Lyle. I mean, you'd think he'd know better. And in fact, he did. He lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, went out after work to get his mail, was just going to zoom out and zoom right back in, but ran into a neighbor and they chatted for 20 minutes. Three days later, Lyle's lying on his bed, hoping that he will die. He's so miserable. He got what's known as the mild form of the disease, and he's very quick to say the mild form of the disease is not fun. And people who get that usually recuperate at home, but it may take them two to three months to do it. Lyle's a marathon runner. He couldn't run a marathon for a full year. So it had some really devastating effects for him. The people you're going to see tonight on this are from uh, a wide range of communities in California. So why don't you go ahead and run that, if you wouldn't mind, Kelvin. And uh, I think that their testimony is far better than anything that I could ever tell you about this. Before my experience with West Nile virus, I was an extremely active person. I was a mason. A Poured concrete, laid brick, block, and stone. Had been doing that for 30 years. I uh, went camping all the time, uh, every other weekend. After West Nile, I am only able to do limited amounts of activities. I had three days of a headache that was a very intense headache and different from any headache I had had before in my life. Went to bed one evening and woke up the next morning at five o'clock in the morning with these severe sharp pains in my head. I woke up one morning and I felt real sluggish. I laid down and I didn't wake up for 24 hours. And when I tried to get out of bed, I realized that I had no feeling in either leg. They were, they were both paralyzed. Neither leg would hold me up. I just collapsed onto the floor. I had some problems with long-term memory see people that I knew very, very well and absolutely could chatter with them about their experiences or work that we had done together, could not pull up a name. I was shown a photo with me in it in Las Vegas and, and I can't remember being there. My wife could give me a list of things to do. If it's not wrote down, I can't remember. Even if she does write it down, I can't remember to look for the list. Memory is a problem for me because there's a space of time that I lost that I keep looking to find out what happened in the 30 days that I was in the hospital. Long-term memory is a problem, and uh, at times short-term memory can be a problem. I feel I probably was exposed, although I don't real remember any specific mosquito bites, and that was in a very, very stagnant creek area near Chico. I was bitten just above the ankle. I was in my neighbor's house for his uh, open house. I didn't have repellent the night uh, I got bitten. I knew that my house was free of mosquitoes, so I assumed that his house was also free of mosquitoes, and I was wrong. It's important for people to wear repellent, to wear protective clothing, empty standing water, and don't be out during dusk and dawn. When I found out I had West Nile, I've told everybody I know that they do need to use insect repellent, not just when they go camping or fishing or hiking. They need to use insect repellent when they walk their dogs in the morning. West Nile virus has made me a dependent who cannot drive an automobile, who cannot walk unaided, who cannot even get up the stairs without a stair glide in my own home. I wouldn't want another family to have to go through what my family has been through. Be aware. Please be aware this could happen to you. I think their testimony speaks volumes. This can be a very serious disease. I will tell you about two other people, and then I'm going to turn it over to Karen, or uh, Barbara, rather. Um, there is a man in Boise, Iowa, who, or Idaho, rather, who is 43 or 44 years old, 6'4", 250 pounds, walked outside in his backyard, got bitten by a mosquito, 
now confined to a motorized wheelchair because all he can move is his neck a little bit and his thumb and forefinger on one hand. Um, there are other folks who are similarly paralyzed from this. And we went to a meeting of the CDC and a lot of other people in February in Savannah where the scientists and physicians there were telling us that they don't understand why it is that certain people tend to be more susceptible. Now, now when we started off with West Nile, it looked like it was people over 50. But last year, the youngest person in California to get West Nile virus was three months old, and the oldest was 99. So I guess you could say the average is 50. But it spans the spectrum of age group. And the 40 to 50 group appears to be more prone to getting the paralytic type disease than some of the other age groups, and no one has a clue why. It just appears to be that way from the demographics of people who get sick. We also know that people who have diabetes and people who have hypertension are all, also appear to be more susceptible and sort of what you might in, intuitively expect, people with compromised immune systems sometimes are more likely to get this. So with that, I will go away now and let Barbara tell you a whole lot more about the disease, and then I'll come back later and talk about repellents and the other things you can do to protect yourself. Hi, Barbara Kircher, uh, excuse me, Barbara Holtwick. That was a slip. <laughs> and uh, I'm a health educator at uh, Los Angeles County Public Health, and I'm joined tonight by Roger Cruz, who is an RN and also a, let me see if I can get this right, microbiologist. So that's a really strong background for uh, information on West Nile virus. And he's going to be covering more of the medical aspects of it. And he also told me he's going to touch on the H1N1 influenza, which is um, misnamed the swine flu. Let's see, do I have um, sequence up here, the yellow button? No. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And this is a presentation that was put together at um, Public Health. Just to cover everything, I work in the Acute Communicable Disease Control Program. We've been very busy lately. West Nile virus is a mosquito-borne disease, and they found that most mosquitoes do not carry the West Nile virus, but obviously those that do present a great risk, so you're safer assuming any mosquito carries West Nile. And in fact, the mosquitoes are the main spread, particularly for humans. And if there's any horse owners in here tonight, I would plead with you to please get your horses vaccinated if you know, if you know of any. They do have a West Nile virus vaccination for horses if you do know of anybody who has a horse. It's a, it's a horrendous disease. The horses really suffer if they get it, and, and most of them die. You can also get it through blood transfusion, organ transplants, and mother to child through pregnancy and breastfeeding, although this is more rare than um, even people who get it uh, in a mosquito-infested area. It's not spread by person to person, so that's good news for any of us. We can still continue our personal lives. and. Uh, most people are at a low risk, but if you figure, why take the chance? You know, why expose yourself to it when you have repellent? You can wear long clothing. You can dump the water on your property. There's a lot of things you can do to prevent it. And, of course, working with your mosquito control district is, is the best insurance, as far as I'm concerned. So for me, it's similar to working with public health and other um, beneficial agencies that you have available to you in our, in our communities. They do test blood donors now, and um, so you're not likely to get it from a blood transfusion. They have that down pat. It was first isolated in Uganda in 1937, way, way back then. 
And then it was first documented in New York in 1999. And then the mosquitoes made their way across the United States. Public health and other professionals who were concerned with vector control had four years to study it and prepare for it. And you could literally see it travel across the state, states, the infected mosquitoes. What they do is they test um, chickens. We have a whole flock of chickens on the roof of the building where I work, and they take blood samples from the chicken and see if any of them have been infected with West Nile virus. I believe uh, you do that also. Mosquito control districts do that also. Now you can see the comparison of the symptomatic uh, patients with the asymptomatic patients who get infected. And you can also see the variance. It's, it's very difficult to predict how it's going to be from one year to the next. And LA County has had a significant number of cases as compared with California, as compared with uh, the United States. And we're very fortunate down here to have a lot of warm weather, but we also have a lot of um, man-made waterways and man-made uh, water containers such as pools and canals and um, wading pools. I like to demonstrate that mosquitoes don't really need much to lay a bunch of eggs. Now, I'm sure mosquito control people are know this, but you can get about a thousand mosquitoes harvesting out of this much water. Just a bottle cap. This is from a, a Diet Coke bottle. So can you imagine what you can get out of a green pool? Now granted, they're just on the surface, but still if you figure the square footage across a pool versus the whatever square inches are in here and then extrapolate it. The kicker is too, a lot of uh, houses, homes are being foreclosed on and they have swimming pools and then they're no longer residents and if the bank takes over the house, is the bank going to take care of the pool? Probably not unless they're fined, so I'm hoping they fine every bank. But it does, it presents this excellent breeding ground for mosquitoes. The best thing you can do is report your green pool to your mosquito district uh, and or the um, city authorities. But you, during the... Um, course of the summer, you really need to be aware of West Nile virus, the whole mosquito season. And this is a map of the number of cases. They track the number of cases. And you can see the population of infected individuals up north in Antelope Valley, particularly Lancaster right now. This is kind of a hierarchy of how it affects people. 80% of the population to date uh, don't to feel no symptoms. And then 20% uh, quote milder systems, unquote. I wouldn't want to experience what they define as mild symptoms, symptoms not after hearing uh, about the real life cases tonight. And then 1% get really serious symptoms where there's paralysis, encephalitis and such. Out of that, um, 1%, 0.1% die. Now that's a pretty small figure, but 1% end up with very serious illnesses. I'd really Roger, uh, rather refer to Roger on this because he can give you a better description of um, these different illnesses. and their symptoms, but it's the West Nile uh, virus fever will give you a fever, headache, muscle pains, etc., a lot like um, the flu will, but apparently they're more severe. I haven't had the um, opportunity of talking to anyone who's actually gotten the disease, but I have seen films like that and I've read statistics and talked to the doctors. It's to be taken seriously, even though as I said, most mosquitoes don't carry it, but those that do have the capacity to infect humans. They carry it in, um, 
they take your blood and then feed that to their uh, the eggs that they lay and then the eggs feed off of that as they develop but what they do is when they bite you they inject saliva into your blood and that's what causes the infection it takes a laboratory to confirm the diagnosis they have to test and culture your blood or your spinal fluid there's really no treatment there's bed rest and um, hospital support for anybody that gets a severe infection antibiotics do not work West Nile is a virus not a bacteria and as far as I know as a non-medical person and Roger can confirm this the very famous Tamiflu right now doesn't have any effect on West virus so don't look for any miracle with it please there is a probable lifetime immunity, but I just as soon not get infected to begin with. And I imagine you feel the same way. And again, people at the highest risk for a life-threatening disease are within a specific group. And less than 1% of people bitten by infected mosquitoes develop the West Nile disease symptoms. But, you, I mean, anybody could be 1%. Figure the lottery's got a lot greater odds than catching West Nile virus. And how many people play that? So there's resources you can go to, um, including your mosquito control district, who have an incredible selection of health education materials and I say that as a professional I'm very impressed with it and they and they are written for lay people not scientists so thank you very much I appreciate your attention and uh, I'd like to introduce Karen Miller thank you all right good evening everybody All right, um, I'm the entomologist with the uh, local uh, Mosquito and Vector Control District. We've been here for over 50 years now, but most people still don't know that we exist. Um, our, our mission is, of course, to protect the um, public health by reducing mosquitoes and by um, doing our part and also giving um, instructions or, or um, recommendations to people what they can do to reduce uh, the mosquitoes on their own property as well and help us help them to um, understand what we actually do I'll have to go through the life cycle real quick um, on the top left is a adult mosquito laying eggs on the water surface they hatch out into larvae they uh, turn into pupa and they emerge out as adults in the summer, like now when it's hot, that life cycle takes five to seven days. So they can go from egg to flying adult that can bite you in a week. Um, that little white mass that's behind the mosquito, that's a so-called egg raft. That egg raft is about a quarter of an inch long and contains 200 eggs. So if you, again, take the surface of a pool or anything and multiply, you know, add in the little uh, egg grafts in there even if they're just around the edges that's a lot of mosquitoes every week what we do is we kill the mosquitoes while they're in the water because it's a lot easier to treat them that way and we have products that are more um, specific in in killing the mosquitoes and nothing else it's if you had a cup of water a cup of water with 300 mosquitoes in there you can just dump them out and you're done with it if they fly out and be in this room you'd have to treat this whole entire room so that's why it's more efficient and more effective to treat them while they're in the water uh, mosquito-borne diseases are important mainly the majority thing is of course malaria mosquitoes kill more people than anything else in the world 
It kills over a million people every year uh, just for, from the malaria. Of course, we don't have usually malaria here in the United States. Here in California, we deal with some different types of encephalitis, um, and right now we are focusing on West Nile virus, which is also an encephalitis or causes encephalitis. This shows you the spread of West Nile virus across the nation. As Barb said, it started in 99 in New York and rapidly made it across the nation. Um, and that, that was um, very unusual for, for a disease like that. This is the transmission cycle of the West Nile virus. It usually is spread between the mosquitoes and the birds. A, a infected mosquito will bite a bird, then the bird comes inf becomes infected, then another mosquito will bite that bird, then the mosquito becomes infected. Some of those mosqui mosquitoes that are infected can also bite people or other animals um, and infect us. We are so-called dead-end hosts because we don't produce enough virus in our system to in infect mosquitoes. So mosquitoes cannot pick up the virus from us and infect somebody else. They have to get it from the birds to do that. This is a map as of uh, Friday last week of California um, of West Nile cases. The blue counties are those that have human cases. The green counties are those that, ha that show activity in, in birds or in mosquitoes or in chickens or something else. Um, LA County has nine human cases right now. All of those nine are in Lancaster. And that's the highest number in any of the other counties as of right now. So um, like Judy said, we're, we're the hot spot here. And that's why it's so important for you guys to um, get the message and, and spread the message that this is an important thing. It mostly affects birds, crows, sparrows, and, fi and finches seem to die off really quickly after they get infected. Um, so there's a dead bird hotline set up by the state that you can call. If you see a dead bird, um, report it to them. They, it's a statewide hotline, so they coordinate it. Um, they'll ask you some questions, see if the, the bird is, um, is okay to test, if it's um, fresh enough because they have to take organs out to test it, if it's you know, flat like a pancake, they can't use, use that anymore for testing, but they'll still put a dot on the map saying, okay, there was a reported dead bird there. Even if they can't use it for testing, it's still a report, and if there's a cluster of reports, then, you know, it, the flag comes up and says, okay, something's going on here, we need to check into that more, and we get notified by that. Um, again, there's a hotline, or also you can report it online. Um, horses, like we said, there's, um, there was, when it first started, it was about 50% mortality. It's gone down quite a bit. Uh, right now, we've only had one horse case reported in the Antelope Valley. Um, there's three vaccines available, and they seem to work really well. Like I said, what we do is we kill the larvae. Um, we go around, um, we also do adult mosquito surveillance where we set traps, um, see what kind of mosquitoes we have, in what numbers they are, and um, do follow-ups on if, if there's ca human cases or, or other dead birds to see if they were infected right there or some, somewhere else. Um, so these are our routine things. Our guys spraying retention basins, uh, ditches, curbs and gutters. Um, so if you see the little white trucks driving around, that's us. If it's not the city of Lancaster, <laughs> they have white trucks too. Um, but of course the big problem are backyard sources. Um, like Barb said, swimming pools is, is a humongous problem, but even small containers that are in the backyard can can breed tremendous amounts of mosquitoes. So if you have, you know, a bucket of water sitting around 
and for some reason sprinklers got water in there you know make sure to check it out dump it out at least once a week so that mosquitoes can't survive or can't come out of there um, just interrupt their life cycle dump it out um, for adult mosquito surveillance we have different types of traps that are used for different ways of uh, checking for the mosquitoes um, then we have sentinel chickens we have eight different coops around the area um, that we take blood samples every other week from the good thing about the chickens is that first of all they don't get sick from West Nile virus they don't die from West Nile virus uh, so they don't get hurt if they get infected and because they're stationary they're in this one coop we know if we can test for the antibodies and we know if if they show up uh, having antibodies that they were infected right there with birds they could have been flying you know from wherever and, and just drop dead right here so with the with the chickens we know if they are infected there's infected mosquitoes right in that area um, Barb showed you the numbers of human cases in LA County um, and you saw that in 2004 was the highest number our numbers got really high in 2005 not not the humans but the birds and the chickens that's the pink bar and then this year again in 2009 it's really really high down below everything south of the St. Gabriel's they had really high numbers last year and they had really high numbers in 04 so we're like a year after they have their peak we have our peak so last year when they had all their their big numbers and big outbreaks I knew or I was pretty sure that we would have um, a bumper crop this year so uh, we tried to prepare for it um, so now the three D's that's the thing that you can do to protect yourself first of all drain all standing water around the house around your property if it's there for more than a week it can have mosquitoes in it so dump it out at least once a week dusk and dawn that's when the mosquitoes are most active that's when you need to go out uh, when you need to defend yourself and wear repellents with DEET or with picaridin or with lemon eucalyptus or something like that also if it um, make sure in the evening when it cools down and you're opening up your windows to let some cool air in that your screens fit tight so the mosquitoes don't come into your house and if you're out at dusk and dawn either wear repellent or long sleeves and long pants the less skin you have showing the less repellent you have to use so with that I'll give it over to Judy again there are some important things to know about insect repellent first of all insect repellent does not kill mosquitoes or ticks it simply repels them and in fact when you use insect repellent on your skin what happens when the ingredient when the active ingredient is DEET is that it inhibits the mosquitoes ability to detect carbon dioxide and some other things that we exude just normally as we breathe and as we live so the mosquitoes not able to find you in effect if you're wearing repellent but what's really critical here is that if you spray yourself with repellent and you don't smooth it evenly on your skin you're gonna miss some spots and somebody said to me today the perfect analogy and you ladies will know what I'm talking about you know the instant suntan lotion that you put on and you think oh I've got this really smooth application it's perfect and the next day you look like a zebra and you see how many spots you missed well if you miss a spot like that a mosquito can find a spot the size of a dime that doesn't have repellent on it and will go after that spot on you that's the size of a dime so when you apply repellent you have to really be careful to make sure that you not only spray it on your skin like this and you don't need a lot but that you spread it on all of your exposed skin 
Now, if I were going to walk outside tonight, I wouldn't have to spray underneath my jacket because the mosquitoes aren't going to bite through my jacket, but they could get me on any exposed spaces. And the other thing that you should do to put it on your face, you'd never do this, for heaven's sakes, to yourself or anyone else. You put it on your hands, and then you apply it to your face, and you apply it to your neck. And if you're wearing shorts, think about where you miss when you're putting lotion on your legs, behind your knees, around your ankles. And because mosquitoes tend to fly low, a lot of the bites occur knees and below. Not all, but a lot. So that's important to do. But well before you get to the point of applying, you need to think about which product you're going to use and what you need to know about it. We always recommend that you use a product that carries the EPA registration number. There are four active ingredients. One is DEET, one is a new compound called picaridin, one is oil of lemon eucalyptus, and one is IR3535. Those are the only four that have been registered by the EPA in this country. And you can find out if the product you're thinking about buying carries that registration by looking on the back panel, which has print on it so small that I would need my glasses and a magnifying glass to read. But never you mind. Bring your magnifying glass to the store if you must. On the back, on this back panel, above, usually above this uh, barcode, you'll see an EPA registration number. That gives you a level of confidence that the product you're about to buy has been tested for safety and for efficacy, so you know it's going to work. And that's really important, especially when you live in the hot spot for West Nile virus. Now, the other important thing to know about repellent is that all of the elements on the label are required by the EPA. So that's one of the reasons why there's so much on here. This thing ought to be the size of a billboard so we can read it, but it's not. Um, on the front panel, you will find the active ingredients named. So if it's DEET, you'll see the word D-E-E-T, and then it'll have dot, 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 dot over into a percentage. And the percentage is run from 5% to 100%. The 5% works just as well as the 100%, only it doesn't last as long. The 5% will last an hour to 90 minutes, whereas the 100% will last 12 hours or so. Nobody in this country needs to wear 100%. If you're traveling to Africa where there is malaria or other places where there's dengue, yes, you may want to think about that because the mosquito pressure is pretty heavy there. But in this country, you can usually use something between 5 and 30 percent to great effect. And we always suggest that you buy a product that reflects how you're going to use it, i.e., how long are you going to be outside. So if you're going to have a barbecue outside for 90 minutes, think about something maybe a 10 percent or maybe even a 15 percent, because that'll take you for 90 minutes up to a couple of hours. If you're going to be gardening for 90 minutes, 7%, 10%, something like that. And the beauty of the lower concentrations is, thanks to the companies that make this stuff, they have worked so hard to make the deep-based products smell nice. If you, I mean, you're all old like me, and you probably remember when you had to put insect repellent on when you were a kid. It smelled awful, and it was greasy and yucky, but no more, so tonight, You'll see some products up here, and I invite you to come and take one, but also test some of the others so that you know what they feel like. But this is a really nice product. Now, I put that on my arm, and it's not greasy, and it's not smelly. It smells nice. It has a nice floral scent to it. So you can find a product that will work for you. Now you know that the concentration means how long it will work for you, and you know if you've got an EPA registration on the back that it's going to do what it's supposed to and protect you. There are a number of urban legends around repellents that I think are really worth discussing. Um, one is related to the oil of lemon eucalyptus ingredient that's available in some products. The people who make DEET-based products also make the picaridin products and the oil of lemon eucalyptus product. But what's critical here, and especially we find this in California, you all are so inventive, I love it. But in this case, it's not going to do you any good. What we've learned that Californians are doing is going to a health food store and buying lemon oil and eucalyptus oil and saying, oh, wonderful, I'll make my own. Make up their own little homebrew, slap it on, and get bitten by mosquitoes and go, well, why? 
Well, the reason is that the oil of lemon eucalyptus product that carries the EPA registration has millions of dollars of testing behind it to prove that it works so that you know that the formulation is there that's going to do the trick. When you use a natural oil-based product that doesn't carry an EPA registration, you might as well use Crisco oil because the only thing that's keeping the mosquitoes away is the oil. And once it, it absorbs into your skin, the mosquitoes come back. Effectively, what happens is, think of an aircraft carrier with an oil slick on the deck. What happens when the planes land? Sink. And that's what happens with the mosquitoes, with an oil base like that, too. So those things don't work, and you put yourself at some peril, I think, by using them. Um, the other interesting phenomena are things like dryer sheets. And I don't want to mention any brand names, but there's one that I particularly like. It smells really great. And from time to time, I'll see somebody with a hat on with dryer sheets hanging down. And it looks like they're part of the French Foreign Legion. You know how they have a hat with the, with the cloth down behind? Well, dryer sheets don't work as a, as a mosquito repellent. I'm really sorry. And neither does garlic. Uh, my friend Susan Little, who regrets she couldn't be here tonight, she normally gives this presentation, says, Garlic makes your food taste great. Julia Childs used to say you can never have too much garlic, and she's right. It makes your breath smell bad, your food tastes great, but it will not repel mosquitoes. There are some new vitamin B1 patches that you can go out and buy. Well, good luck, because you better buy some insect repellent with an EPA registration on it if you're going to wear the patch, because the patch will not do the trick, and you put yourself at risk. The the nature of the business of repellent is that this stuff is really studied. The DEET that's in this particular product has been around for 57 years. It has a very long history. The American Academy of Pediatrics reviewed all of the data again, both published and unpublished, in 2002. And in 2003 came out and said, children as young as two months of age can use a deep base product in concentrations up to 30%. Now, I think that speaks volumes about how the American Academy of Pediatrics feels about the relative safety of repellent products. The oil of lemon eucalyptus product has an age limit of three years. Picaridin is like DEET, about two months. How are these ingredients alike or different, the EPA registered ones? IR3535 is used only in one product, and that is the Skin So Soft Bug Repellent product. Um, Picaridin is equal unit for unit to DEET in same concentration. So 5% concentration picaridin will give you the same protection that a 5% concentration DEET will. Picaridin is not available in higher concentrations because the EPA is still awaiting all of the testing to be completed on the higher concentrations. I suspect even when those higher concentrations are available, and to my knowledge, the highest concentration available now in picaridin is about 10%. Once the higher concentrations are available, they're likely to be a lot more expensive than a comparable DEET product because that ingredient is much more expensive. So people will have a choice, but they'll have to pay more probably. Uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus, like other essential oils, uh, as I said, is restricted to kids who are above the age of three. And the reason for that is that essential oils sometimes cause a skin reaction. So uh, you need to make sure that when you're using a repellent, that you, if you're sensitive to fragrances in other kinds of products that you use, like I'm allergic to eyeshadow, I can't wear eyeshadow, I get just completely blown up. So when I'm trying a cosmetic, I always put it on the inside of my wrist. This is a nice place to test repellents if you are allergic to a fragrance in anything else. And there are unscented fragrances as well. So if you know that you're sensitive, then you might think about getting a product of that sort. The products come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. This is a liquid that spritzes. There are aerosols. There are like baby wipes and all different kinds of concentrations in all those ranges. So you can pretty much find something that suits. And most of them cost about 4 to $5. 
And this bottle will last a, a family of four probably for a year, sometimes two, depending on how much they're outside. So it's a pretty economical thing to do. And I always have this by my back door. When I go outside, I put it on. It takes a little work to think through doing that. But I'm telling you, if I lived in a hot spot for West Nile, I would have a sign on top of it that says, put me on, because I think it's really important to do that. Um, after Roger's finished, we'll take questions that you all may have. So I'm going to let him do his thing. But we have information here that is available to you. Excuse me. Um, we have brochures that are available free of charge. On the back, there is an 800 number, and there is a website where you can get more information. Um, you can order these and give them out to your neighbors. We'll send them. We've given away millions of these over the course of the last couple of years. Um, this is the one for families, and it talks about applying repellent to kids. This is a one. It's the same copy, except it drops out the information on kids, but it makes the type bigger. So for people like me who can't see without their glasses on, you can now read it. So that's pretty good. And it explains a lot of what this stuff on this label says. So there's a way to find out what it says. And the website also has lots of information. I want to tell you one other thing about um, children. Some people ask us, well, how old does a child have to be before they can apply a repellent themselves? And we always say, if you can read the label and understand what it says, then you're old enough to be able to do it for yourself. Otherwise, mom, dad, grandparent needs to help. And it's very important that um, the child, when you put it on a little kid, you know how they always have their fingers in their mouths? Always. That seems that you wonder if they're not going to gnaw their way up to their elbow sometimes or their tongue is out all the time. So you don't want to put it on the fingers of a toddler or around the mouth of a toddler who's got his tongue out all the time because it tastes awful, beyond awful. You also don't want to get it in the eyes of anybody because it, all of these are alcohol-based and they will sting like the devil. Now the stinging stops when you splash water in the eyes, but why go through that? Just avoid that altogether. So if you're going to spray it on a child, spray it on the skin, smooth it on, to put it on their face, do it like you do on your own face, spray it on your hands, smooth it on, and you're done. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so much about the West Nile virus. My name is Roger Cruz, and I, uh, I'm a public health nurse. I have a new job being a community liaison public health nurse for the area. So uh, as a public health nurse, I would like to discuss good health practices, which we need uh, not only for preventing West Nile virus, but all other infections. Now, I uh, just like uh, what she mentioned that West Nile virus can affect all ages from three months to 99 years old. I believe you, because like if the mother does not feed the baby with, uh, with the breast milk, those breast milk contain maternal antibodies, and it's good for six months. So if the baby has an immune uh, system that's really weak and no breastfeeding, most likely she'll get the West Nile virus. Same thing with 18 to 19 years old uh, teenagers. What they do, they sleep less, they eat junk foods. So the bottom line is that their immune system is low. And of course, the 40 to 50, when you get old, your immune system gets old too. So we are all susceptible to other infections. 
So let's start working, I mean, uh, talking about good health practices. Hand washing is the most important way to prevent spread of germs. How many infections can we prevent by doing hand washing? A lot. Salmonella, hepatitis A, things like that. It reduces your chance of getting many diseases. Always wash your hands with soap and water and, you in, and using the bathroom, di diapering a baby, and before preparing food. At least 15 seconds. Wash your hands like Count 15 seconds. Cover your mouth with disposable tissue when you cough or sneeze. I would suggest when you sneeze, use your shoulder like that. Instead of, you know, what if you don't have any uh, uh, tissues? So you can use your shoulder. Encourage others not to speed in public places. Exercise 30 minutes daily. It's very, very important. You notice if you don't exercise, you feel like lethargic and you feel like, you know, dragging yourself. Eat a balanced diet including five fruits and vegetables per day. It's very, very important. Five fruits and vegetables, either two fruits and three vegetables or three fruits or three vegetables and two fruits. And limit caffeine intake and processed foods. Get seven to eight hours of sleep. Teenagers don't do that. I have teenagers, that's why I know. Update your family's immunizations, keep a record. Make sure you get a flu shot this season. I put up some flyers there for the, uh, for the seasonal flu shots uh, on this, uh, in the Antelope Valley area. Most illnesses are caused by two kinds of germs. Bacteria can cause strep, strep throat, some ear and sinus infections. Antibiotics can work. Viruses cause the common cold and the flu. Antibiotics do not work. It's two different things. Only buy antibiotics with a prescription from a healthcare provider. Do not self-medicate or use other people's medication. How, how many people are doing that? Especially when, when we have cases of chlamydia, they share the medication and then they come back to our clinic. It says still not, still not working because they share the, the antibiotic. They didn't actually complete the treatment. Take antibiotic according to doctor's instructions. Finish doses. What can I do to protect myself and my family? For all emergencies, prepare as for an earthquake or other emergencies. We're expecting a big one. Keep enough supplies in your home to meet your needs for at least three to seven days. Have a plan to contact family members if something happens during the work day. So make sure you have some, some relatives or cell phone in the other areas, like in New York, because all the phone lines will be clogged up when there's really an emergency in California in our area. This, uh, these are suggestions like three to seven days worth of supplies and water, food that will not spoil, can opener for canned food, one change of clothing and footwear per person, one blanket or sleeping bag, per person, first aid kit with family's prescription, don't forget your medications, emergency tools, a battery powered radio, flashlight, and plenty of extra batteries, sanitation supplies, special items for infant, elderly, or disabled family members, extra pair of eyeglasses, important family documents stored in a waterproof container, keep a smaller kit in the trunk of your car, extra set of car keys, a credit card, cash or traveler's checks is suggested. Possible reaction in a stressful event people may experience. Anxiety, fear, anger, sadness, difficulty sleeping and concentrating, loss of security, physical symptoms, increased use of tobacco and alcohol. Coping skills, deep breathing and mental imagery. Picture yourself doing something pleasant. Focus on well-being, Focus on the support systems you have in place, family, friends, pets, and etc. Volunteer with your church, school, or other agencies to gain a sense of control. This is the mental health hotline for LA County. Question and answers. Thank you for listening. So you've heard tonight from a lot of our experts who've come out here tonight to talk about West Nile virus and, and what to do 
from public health. Um, if any of you folks out here have any questions or comments, um, our folks are here and available to answer any of the questions. So I'll open it up to the floor. Do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Karen? Karen? I was going to ask if you can come up here because. And the, the question is, how long does it take to um, see symptoms um, when you do get a bite? So. It's usually about three to 14 days before you get symptoms. Severe, severe headache. Um, then a lot of people uh, say they have sharp pains in their eyes. Some people show rashes um, and, and muscle weakness and aches, just like you know when you get the flu, when you really just don't want to get up, when you just feel really bad. Well, um, if you are concerned and if you don't really show symptoms, and, but you really, really, really want to know, you can always donate blood because they test all blood donations. And that way, if, if, you, ha if you have West Nile virus, you'll, you'll know. If you don't have West Nile virus, you just donated some blood for somebody that's sick. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Yes. It's in, in the uh, paperwork that we have here. They're they're kind of spread out, but then the the information we get, you know, with HIPAA laws, we can't, uh, you know, say anything particular um, about where they are and in what locations. But they're they're yeah yeah. But we get you know with the birds we have we had a huge concentration in um, in central to west Lancaster. But now we have a lot in on East Lancaster. They're also moving into Quartz Hill and West Palmdale. So just because we haven't seen anything yet in Palmdale doesn't mean it's not there. It's just we haven't detected it yet. And um, we're getting a lot of reports from the people in Lancaster on dead birds. So we get more birds picked up there too. Oh, um, yeah, usually if, if you have a pool and you keep it maintained and it's chlorinated properly, you're not going to have mosquitoes go in there. Um, they don't like the smell. They, li they, they actually eat the algae that's in the water. And um, so if, you know, the, and the bacteria that's in the water, the, the chlorine will kill that. So they don't even go near those. But if you have a green pool that already has mosquitoes in there and you dump chlorine in there, it's not really going to kill them. It might kill a few, but it's not going to get rid of them. So best thing to do is keep up your pool or if for some reason you can't afford to or you don't want to have a pool right now for whatever reason, just drain it out. You can get a pump at you know one of those rental places for fairly cheap. I think it was like 20 bucks when we checked, and um, then pump it out. If it's dry, there's no mosquito, mosquito problem. Plus, with with a pool that's green and full, you have other issues with you know people falling in, and you 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 know they drown, and you won't even see them. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a lot of mosquitoes at your house, or? Okay, 
Uh, we can set up a trap in your house if you give me your information and we'll, we'll set a trap there to see what's going on. Yes, any, any, I mean, if you have a smaller container with water, dump it out at least once a week. If you have bigger, you know, those huge horse troughs, fountains, ponds or something like that, we have mosquito fish that we give away for free at our office. Um, the, the, our phone number and address is on the pamphlets. Just give us a call uh, ahead of time to make sure that we have fish. Sometimes we kind of run low on supplies and I don't want you to make a trip for nothing. Uh, we're located just here in Lancaster off L4 and 6th Street East so it's not that far but um, yeah they're like little guppies and they they reproduce really well and, and are hardy and they can be in all kinds of situations and uh, get rid of the mosquitoes that way. Great, any more questions? Well, we thank again um, everyone for coming out tonight and, and hearing the presentation. Again, I do encourage you to go back uh, to your neighbors and, and have them. We'll have this up on our website probably within a week, hopefully earlier than that, but I can only I can promise you a week. And, and then again, we'll have this uh, up on, on our programming for our Channel 28 government pro, um, uh, channel there. And I, again, I want to thank Karen and Barbara and uh, Roger. <laughs> Sorry, Roger, and Judy as well. Who's, Judy's actually come from the uh, East Coast, so we do appreciate her coming in um, to give this presentation. And they did this also at the city of Palmdale, so we do appreciate um, her and um, Susan, who was here earlier this morning doing a presentation at the uh, Senior Center, coming out to do this presentation. And I'll invite you to come back out here and, and offer the, the product if that's what you'd like to do. Please come forward before you leave and take some literature home and take a product home with you so that you're protected. Okay? Nice to see you all tonight. <laughs>